Och du har fått uh, en gång telefon. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, so I was invited here just this weekend, so I put together some slides and uh, I will try to summarize this subject for you in 15 minutes or 20 minutes, so I hope some of you are still awake at least. Um, Everdrone is a Swedish company operating from outside the Gothenburg and uh, we started off really as a technolo technology, de technology development company and um, trying to solve a number of very specific challenges that we saw in the drone industry. And, we were pretty successful at doing that, I believe. Um, unfortunately, we found out that there's no market for this technology yet. So we needed to build the market ourselves. And now we're really in this interesting transition from being a developing uh, development uh, technology company into being an operator as well. Um, and from the very beginning, we have had a very clear focus that we want our technology to come to use uh, for applications that are beneficial for society. And uh, we have this vision of using autonomous drone technology to save lives. Um, so it's very natural for us to focus on healthcare and emergency response applications. And I will start off by showing a film from a project we did a couple of months ago this summer. So this is a uh, film uh, recorded at Saltgrenska University Hospital outside Gothenburg. The remote crew is doing the pre-flight briefing and all the checks of the vehicle and so on. And we're going to conduct the very first urban beyond visual line of sight delivery in Sweden in this film. The flight route stretches about 4.4 kilometers and is 100% autonomous. Uh, so there's no hands on the keyboard or the controls throughout this entire flight. And I say autonomous and not automated because we also have a 360-degree sense and avoid system on board, the, uh, on board the drone. So it's able to make intelligent decisions depending on the surrounding itself. And the landing spot that we selected was also very challenging because between buildings in this sort of urban canyon, you, don't, can, you can't rely on GPS reception. So the landing procedure that you see here is fully autonomous and made possible through our vision navigation system. So the purpose of this flight or this project, I would say, we didn't really consider it a test project. It was more of a demonstration project to demonstrate for ourselves and to the authorities and to everyone else as well uh, that we are actually at a state where we can do this type of operations in a safe manner, uh, at least on a small scale. And we can do it from a technical perspective and a regulatory perspective. And that's pretty exciting. And I think that is uh, signif significant for where the, uh, the drone delivery industry or drone delivery sector is at this stage. Um, and uh, I was thinking uh, this weekend and yesterday, how can I sort of summarize uh, what we achieved here in, in a good way? And I came to the conclusion that I don't really want to talk about the past too much because it's sort of obsolete, we moved forward. And I don't re really want to talk about the future as well because it's sort of secret what we plan to do next. So what should I talk about? I came up with the idea, okay, let's uh, see a number of lessons learned that we have gained through the past three years. And I tried to approach this from three different uh, angles really. So we have the technical perspective, we have the regulatory perspective, and we have the business perspective. So I'll try to compress this in a number of findings uh, for you in, in a short time span here. And let's start with the uh, concept of functional safety. We're not coming from the aviation industry, but we have a long history uh, within the company to build very reliable and robust software. We have software developers coming from the automotive industry, from the gaming industry, uh, and even a guy working with, uh, previously working with, with satellite communication and things like that. So we have a good understanding for software and reliable systems. And this makes a lot of sense when going into the drone industry, because in the drone industry, we really need to work side by side with the 
current manned aviation industry. And when we talk about functional safety in that regard, we, we really like talking about cheese. And how many have seen the Swiss cheese model before? Most of you, very good. Um, a friend of my mind working in Norway, uh, he said that in Norway you have brun ost, so this is not a problem because that's a very solid piece of cheese. Um, but for the rest of us, this is a very relevant illustration of, of the challenges we're facing. So each of these slices of cheese is representing a technical system or a human procedure or safety layer or something like that. And when you have a hazard threatening the system as a whole, you must make sure that the hazard is not penetrating all of the layers of safety that you have in, in your operation. Uh, because the end result might then be a catastrophic incident. Uh, it could be a person injured or, or killed even. So to be a little bit more concrete, uh, how we're approaching this when it comes to the propulsion system at Everdrone, we start off with a super reliable propulsion system to start with. Um, we have a high redundancy in terms of double batteries and double motors on each arm. So that means we can lose a battery in the air, we can, due to malfunction, we can lose an engine, engine, and we can still control the vehicle. And in addition to that, uh, we also have a parachute recovery system that we are about to implement uh, right now. And in addition to that, we have an automated route planning system that are minimizing flight over people altogether. So for a catastrophic event, event to happen, you need to have a hazard that is penetrating all these different layers of safety and all these slices of cheese. Looking at collision avoidance, um, we have developed a 360 degree camera based sense and avoid system. Um, and we're combining data from several stereo vision cameras and it looks, I hope we, there should be a film there. Can we get the film on the lower right to play? No, okay. Um, oh, there's a cursor. This is gonna be great. If you click the film, maybe. We've been working really hard on this, so I want to show you. Okay, there we go. Uh, so the drone is placed on the ground in our lab here and we're merging the data from all these stereo vision cameras and as you can see we have a very high precision three-dimensional image of the drone surrounding up to 20 meters um, and that is that the system have been tested and evaluated thousands and thousands of object detections in different light conditions and so on um, and it's very very reliable but in addition to that we also have very detailed terrain data to base our navigation on. We also have obstacle, uh, obstacle databases. So we know where there are radio masts and the buildings and, uh, and uh, uh, yeah, ground-based obstacles, basically, uh, power lines and so on. Um, so combining all these different systems or sources of data, we are achieving a high level of safety in our collision avoidance as well. And the same logic applies to the GPS uh, system. We have a fallback system in visual navigation and visual positioning, um, and so on and so on throughout the whole uh, drone operation. Um, yes, and la last but not least, we have a remote pilot monitoring the, the live video feed from the uh, from the drone. So, so that's sort of the, the last slice of the cheese. And when you have put together this operation and you have managed to create a system that is safe uh, from your perspective, you need to summarize it. And you can do that uh, in the form of a functional hazard assessment, for example. You basically list all the possible threats, all the possible hazards you have to your operation. You grade them according to probability and severity. You get a risk number. And if the risk number is too high, you need to mitigate it somehow. Chapter two, collaborating with the authorities. This one is obvious, but, and we heard many people talking today about collaboration with the authorities, and collaboration is one of the keys to, to enable this, this type of operations moving forward. Um, and we need to be aware that we are 
working in an aviation context, but we are not an aviation company in that sense. So it means that we cannot just copy paste all the regulatory uh, solutions and all the standards from the aviation industry and put on the drone sector. Because if we did that, we would most likely kill all the business cases or at least a large portion of the business cases. But we can uh, get inspired and we can borrow a lot of the uh, know-how and the knowledge in the aviation sector. And one of the things that have been sort of agreed by the authorities on the European level and all levels is that Introduction of drones in the airspace must not compromise the level of safety that has been achieved for the past 100 years in the, in the aviation industry. And what does that mean? Um, it means that we have to deal with these numbers. Um, it means that we have to talk about ground risk and we have to talk about air risk. So when the authorities, and we in the industry as well, are talking about risk and talking about the target level of safety, we must do it according to these numbers. And what does this mean? It, it, these are the numbers that is considered as acceptable risk in regard of fatality. So the acceptable level of risk is 10 to the minus 9 incidents per flight hour, resulting in a fatality on the ground, and 10 to the minus 7 uh, in regard to air collision uh, resulting in, in fatal injury. And to really grasp these numbers, um, what does it mean? It, it means that we can have one incident per one million flight hours, or one incident per 10 million flight hours. Uh, does anyone know how many flight hours that is uh, counting in years? One million flight hours. I'd save you the time, it's 114 years. So you need to be able to conduct your operations in one, continuously, all day, 24 seven, continuously for 114 years. And then it's acceptable to have one fatal injury on the ground. Uh, and then you add another extra zero on air collision. So these numbers are pretty tough to achieve, but, but still, this is what has been agreed on. We cannot compromise these numbers. This is the level of safety we need to, uh, we need to achieve for our operations. Um, and in order to do that, and in order to communicate with the authorities about these numbers, we need to have a language. We need to have a common language with the authorities to do this. And uh, one way of doing it is through mathematical risk assessments. So let's take the example of, uh, uh, of uh, fatal injury to a person on the ground. How do we calculate that? We, first of all, we must look at the system, the technical system itself, and the system reliability, the Swiss cheese of our operation, basically. And we'll try to identify the likelihood of the system being out of control. And if there's one thing we know about the system that is out of control, is that it will eventually come down. That's the only thing we know, basically. Um, and when it comes down, um, we need to put in the, to the equation how many people are on the ground, what's the population density. And then we need to put in the lethality of the, of the drone itself. So a 20 kilogram multicopter is much more dangerous than a one kilogram fixed wing, for example. And then we can put in mitigating factors as well. So let's say you have a parachute system on your drone. That's a good mitigating factors that will possibly save people on the ground. Or maybe you're operating only in a construction site where people are obligated to wear hard hats or a helmet. So that's also a good mitigating factor. Um, and all together, multiplying these risks, you get the overall risk of someone getting hurt on the ground. This is a pretty complicated method and it's difficult to actually prove the numbers you put into this equation, especially for an industry that is that has a lack of standards and uh, a lack of statistics, to be honest. Um, but it's, it's still a way, and you can do this with conservative, conservative numbers and so on. The other way to do this is uh, to use the new regulations that start applying next summer and use the specific operations risk assessment methodology. Uh, how many people are familiar with the SORA? Quite a few. How many can say that you have a good understanding for the SORA and that you can sit down and actually do a risk assessment based on it? 
some of you as well. That's really great. Um, what this is all about is that you start off with your concept of operations that basically tells what you're going to do, how you're going to do it, when you're going to do it, who's going to fly, what's, uh, what type of machine you're going to use, and so on. And then you take the result from the conops, put into this Sora process, and on the other end, you come out with a number of objectives, a number of safety objectives. Um, and if you're going to perform a low-risk operation, it will be fairly easy to achieve these, uh, these uh, uh, safety objectives. And if you're going to fly in an urban environment, there's people around beyond visual line of sight and so on, a complex and risky operation, then it will be much, much harder to achieve these safety objectives. But overall, if you want to go into an industry or business where you are utilizing advanced or complex drone operations, um, spend some time on studying the Sora. Take a few days and, and understand it because it's already and it will in the coming years become a very good tool for us in the industry to communicate with the authorities, I believe. Chapter three. Finding the business model, maybe the most important thing of all, and I might repeat myself here because, uh, or not myself, but previous speakers, because we, we touched on this earlier, but I just uh, tried to sort of uh, summarize or uh, compile a list of challenges that we're facing ourselves right now in this transition from a technology development company into an uh, operator. Um, as we are moving from test and demonstration projects into a more commercial deployment. Um, and the first thing, and maybe the most important thing, I think, in this area is to dare to be specific. Um, I see some drone companies that are doing inspections and they want to do delivery and first response and uh, they're doing everything. Because they consider the drone business as one business. Um, I would say that there are are two main advantages if you dare to be very specific in your application. And the first one is that uh, it's much easier to communicate in a trustful way. It's much more easy to trust a person that is saying, I'm doing only this and I'm the expert in this. The second is that you truly can become an expert in that specific field. You can start smoking out all those details and the requirements from the end user that you will find when you're becoming specific. And you can also find a lot of corner cases that you need to deal with. And if you manage this, you have a huge advantage before all the other companies that are doing all sorts of things or, or other companies that have specialized in some other area. So there to be specific, I think that's the most important thing here. Um, this one is interesting and I, I want to bring it up because this is something I not very often hear people talking about. Um, and that's, that is that a safe operation is not the same as a successful mission. And let's take the hospital delivery scenario. We're delivering blood or maybe even organs in the future between hospitals. Um, when we in the drone industry are talking about the safe operation and when we're talking to the authorities about safe operation, it might be perfectly fine that one time in 500 or one time in 1,000, uh, the mission ends with an emergency landing in a forest or the drone comes down in a parachute. It's still a safe operation from an from authority perspective. But the end client or the person lying on the operation table that is expecting a kidney or whatever, he might not be fine with your drones failing the mission, even if the operation was safe. So this is just an alignment that needs to be done around expectations between you as an operator and the client. Another factor is weather, and this will always, always be a limiting factor. Um, sure, we will have drones that are better at handling uh, bad weather, wind, rain, snow, whatever. But in the end of the day, weather will always be a limiting factor for this kind of operations. And you need to design your service because the delivery process is really a service. Uh, you need to design that in a way that you have fallback methods uh, when your drones are not operating. Public acceptance. There's not a lot of research on this yet. 
Um, there was a Danish study a few years ago, I think, and we saw what happened in Australia where Google and Wing were operating. Not everyone was super impressed with having drones over their houses. Um, it was a big problem with noise pollution, for example. So that is something that must be taken in consideration as this industry is scaling. And as we are scaling and more of these machines will be in the air, there will also be accidents. And this will also largely, largely affect the public acceptance of these type of missions. And one more thing, dare to challenge your business case. <coughs> you need to ask yourself, are drones really the best solution for this type of application? Let's say that you have a mining company and you want to inspect and measure stockpiles around your, your open mine. Um, maybe you don't need drones. Maybe you need a mast or several masts with cameras on and a really, really good photogrammetry tool, a really good software. Uh, maybe that's a better solution. Some of the transportation cases that I have seen uh, and people have uh, been pursuing. Um, looking a few years ahead, maybe those applications or those use cases are better off using a ground-based autonomous vehicle in the future. Maybe autonomous drones becomes too expensive or too complicated from other perspectives. So think about the use case today and a few years ahead and really ask yourself, is drones the best possible solution? And this is a tricky one because we, everyone in here likes drones, everyone likes the technology, but you need to step outside the drone box and, and think about this. All right, quick summary. Understand the concept of, of functional safety. Super important in the specific drone category. Collaborate with the authorities and make sure that you have a common language. And last but not least, find your business model and dare to be narrow and dare to be specific when designing it. Thank you. <laughs>